OK, now we've got a bit of time for questions, but there was just so much in that session. And what I'm going to suggest that we do is just for literally two or three minutes, why don't you just talk about what you've heard to the person sitting next to you or around your table. Think about what you want to ask, the point you want to make. Just knock it around a bit, and then I'll take as many com comments as I can before I bring the panel back in. I, I have, in consultation with Jenny, decided to cut out some time for some voting this afternoon uh, in order that you can have more time for questioning the panel, because that seems I think that's what you want to do. So uh, let's see how many questions we can take, and then I'll bring in the panel maybe once, maybe twice, before we have our... Uh, it's great to see a tea break. You know, that's an English institution. It's a heritage institution that we've lost, isn't it? The afternoon tea break. I think I'm campaigning for that to come back, but it's going to be here for you in a few minutes' time. So, uh, points, questions, speeches, poems. Um, yes, let's start in Scotland again. Where's the mics? Aha. The hand that's up. I'm actually, go I'm actually going to start in Northern Ireland. Uh -huh. um, um, I think we have kind of accepted, or at least it has been implied up to the last section, that the kind of heritage is for the middle classes, or at least that's the way it has been coming across to me. Um, and I think this is something we should think, not that it is, should be for, but that it has been for, okay? Um, and I think this is something we should think a little bit about. Um, having spent... 10 years, 11 years working in Northern Ireland, heritage was definitely for everybody. And if one looks at the marches at the moment, the loyalist marches and the Republican marches, etc., it's not necessarily the middle classes that are walking those routes. Um, so I think we need to think about the way we conceptualize heritage and, heritage and who heritage is for. And that's why I very much welcome this session that we've just had, because I think that has been tackling that question. Thank you. Good, thank you. Uh, and then there's a lady over there. Sorry, my ears. No, it's fine, Dory. Yep. Go on. No, 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 Anne. Can you oh, go on then. <laughs> oh, I don't know. There's somebody else. <laughs> Very good. Okay, Actually, that was an um, amusing interlude. Right, right yes. <laughs> Um, I'm from Newcastle University. Um, I very much welcome what Kay was talking about in regards to how we interpret heritage and uh, through my research I've been particularly interested in more looking at the processes rather than the content of, of heritage if you like and I've, it's so pleasing to see that last session because I think it's been missing to a certain extent from the debate over the last two days but Mark, what I'd like to ask the panel really is how um, we can how we can ensure that those heritage processes, which is what the last lady referred to as well, are recognised and that very much that inherited element so that we're not just looking back to what were the formerly great personalities or buildings or tangible things, but how very much the, what the people do, the intangible just process of life, is, um, is recognised. And, and I think that would tackle some of these class issues we're talking about. And... Um, contribute to that. So I think this inherited aspect of heritage, I'd like to know how we can tackle that a bit more um, from the okay. panel. Uh, let's come down to the front of the room here. Hi, uh, Morris Davis from the Museum Consultancy. I'm, I'm, I just appreciate the panel's reflections on the words community and communities, and I think not all of you have used it, I think, and probably deliberately so, because I think we've, that term's been used an enormous amount, and I think I'm really not sure what it means. And just as a quick example, I'm uh, um, on the advisory panel for the Paul Hamlin Our Museum Initiative, which is about community empowerment and community engagement. There's a whole model of community partners who are working with museums on decision making and I was surprised, I still am surprised, halfway through the program that a lot of the partners could well be sitting in this room and they're people like you and me rather than who I might see as the community and I think the word community and communities is used with very many meanings. I suppose my question is how does community relate to democracy? <laughs> Great, uh, then um, <laughs> the gentleman here Crispin Truman, Chelsea Conservation Trust. Al Albert said um, we're still a rich country. 
How much does the panel feel that maybe Heritage should be campaigning a bit harder for a bigger slice of the pie? Is it about priorities or is it lack of resources? Okay, and uh, the gentleman there. There, that, yep, and then we'll go over there. Do you see that hand over there? There we are. We'll speed it all up. Right, yep. Pat Thompson, Cardiff Council. Um, naturally, we've been speaking English uh, in today's session. Uh, if we were in Cardiff, it would be bilingual. Uh, language is clearly part of our heritage, an important part of our heritage. There's a hundred languages spoken uh, in different parts of Cardiff. How can we use language to be uh, to help social cohesion as against separating communities? Very good. Um, and then, yeah, over there. Institute. Um, I'd really, I really like this last session, particularly for the sort of pick yourself up, dust yourself off, start all over again approach to thinking through innovation and, and challenges in terms of business and what we do. So I'd like to ask a question and also perhaps if I could be cheeky and ask us to vote on it. Do we have enough innovative, imaginative thinking in the heritage sector, which is perhaps traditionally, you know, is more traditional, to actually address these issues? Because this session is absolutely where we need to be if we're going to make ourselves relevant and take ourselves forward. You know what? We're just going to do that. Uh, so um, the person who's in charge of the questions, the question I think is, do we have enough imaginative and innovative thinking in the heritage sector. Is that, is that what you said, more or less? Very good. And we'll have a, a, the usual range of five options. Yes, lots. Yes, a bit. <laughs> Search me, gov. Uh, not enough. Or I've never seen a good idea in this sector and I've been working <laughs> it for 45 years. So something, something like that. A array of, we'll have that in a few moments. Um, OK, let's take two or three more points before. Oh, yes, right, right in the far corner. Uh, hello, Sharon Amon from the Museum of London. Um, you, somebody just said in the audience, um, talked about the inheritance. I would like the inheritance of heritage. I would like to ask the panel, uh, a thinking of Albert's quote, the Chinese proverb, we sh you know, about having, we should have done things 20 years ago. What should we be doing now, looking at the legacy of the work that we're doing in this room? that will have an impact 20 years from now? Oh, that's a good question. Um, almost impossible to answer, but a great question. Uh, right, have we got the, uh, is it ready? It, no, yes? It's coming, here it comes. This is fantastic. We really are in the 21st century. All right, here we are. We have enough innovative, I should think of that. Strongly agree, agree. Okay, start voting now. Most of you have lost your voting things, haven't you? No, here we go. Uh, well, Yep, very good. We'll get to 150 and then we'll see where we've got to. And the answer is, here we go. Oh, ah, suddenly you've stopped being quite so positive now. Uh, that's quite, in, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? 30, only a third, only a third of you really think that there's enough innovative, imaginative thinking and quite a lot of you disagree. Good question, very good. I want to ask later which, which, which are the biggest vandals for heritage. Is it the Victorians or the grey squirrels? So we'll, um, <laughs> we'll ask. We'll ask. Or the badgers. OK, so we've got Victorians, grey squirrels, and badgers so far as heritage vandals. Uh, we'll see if we get a couple more before tea. Um, and it, 1960s town planners. So we've got uh, 1960s town planners, grey squirrels, badgers, and the Victorians. One more we'll have, and then we'll... Uh, Heritage professionals, very good. <laughs> we have heritage professionals as the first category. We'll have one more point and then we'll bring the panel back in. Uh, yeah, let's take the lady over there. Thank you, Diana Murray. I'm one of the people who just um, voted that I do think we've got enough innovation and good ideas. Um, I think we've seen an awful lot of them today and in my experience we've had um, hundreds and hundreds of them. I think. One of the things for me was the point that Baroness Andrews made, is that you need an action plan that diverts resources to where they're most needed. My experience is we've had lots and lots of small grants or grants or innovative ideas that can be funded. You prove the point, you prove they work, and then there's no way of actually putting them into action. And I, we haven't really talked today about diverting resources to where they matter, even cross-sectoral. The thing about doing that is, of course, you've got to stop doing something in order to do the things that work. 
And I think that is probably one of the most important things that we will have to address, and I wondered if the panel will agree. Bob's jumping up and down and wanting to answer that. So, Bob, why don't we pick just a couple of points, if you could. I'm uh, going to pick uh, a small point, but I think it's an important one. Um, I happen to be a lawyer with a business degree, but I've worked uh, it, tangentially in your sector, but I'm not part of your sector. And in the United States, we have philanthropies that can give grants to groups like myself or my organization to challenge you to imagine a new job. <laughs> so I'm going to use an example. It's not whether you're creative. You're operating a facility, and I'm coming in and saying, I have an idea for you, but I have some money also. So I went to the Ford Foundation, to their poverty program, and said, I believe that we should challenge some museum directors to really be different. And they said, OK, here's a couple hundred thousand dollars. Why don't you select some museum directors? So I went into the Queens Museum, which is a fairly modest income borough of New York City, and I went to see Tom Finkelpearl, the director, who's a renowned uh, historian of art. And I said, Tom, are you aware that about two miles away is the villa, a plaza called Astoria Plaza, that the community schools uh, use 80 different languages, is primarily a core of Central American and Mexican undocumented immigrants, and I bet you they've never heard of your museum. Would, if I paid you, would you take your staff and you and come to a meeting, and I will bring translators to see whether we can engage the community to engage your museum. So Tom said yes. We went there. Um, none of the people that ever heard of the Queen's Museum, although it was two miles away, they had no reason to ever go there. And then Tom said, what can we do for you? And he said, well, the community said, there's a lot of pigeon poop on our plaza. Could you help clean the pigeon poop? True story. So Tom said, sure, I'll get my museum and, 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 and our volunteers, and Saturday we will come and help you clean the pigeon poop. And after they cleaned the pigeon poop, then they said, well, could you come back next week and can we have a fiesta? And the museum said, yeah, well, we could organize a fiesta, we can organize parties, events. And the third week they said, we need some health services. Is there any way in which you could enroll us in a health service plan because many of us are undocumented? Tom found a way, enrolled 200 people in a health insurance program. The next month after they started doing a, a guide to the local restaurants in Spanish and in, 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 in Russian, they came back and said, we have, are sending all money home for, to our co home countries to take care of our families with remittances. The fees are high. You have stature. Can you negotiate a lower remittance fee for sending money home? Which he did. Uh, the new... <laughs> Good story. The new mayor of New York, Mayor de Blasio, just named Tom as the director of cultural affairs, spending $500 million a year in New York on that story, saying he knows how to make a museum care about a community. He's the new director of, of cultural affairs for New York City. Inspiring. Very interesting. Okay, uh, Albert, pick a couple of points to respond to. Well, I, I, I want to pick the one up, uh, uh, two that I modeled together. One is the whole thing about class and how you, how you involve people who are not normally involved. And the other one is, I think I would, I would typify as the problem with democracy. The problem with democracy is it can give you very strange results. Um, so one of my big examples is I spent a lot of my life fighting for Notting Hill Carnival, which I think is a British heritage, uh, uh, intangible cultural heritage issue. But one of the problems we had in the early days of Carnival was everybody said it didn't make money. It really didn't make money, it wasn't viable. But the question was, who didn't it make money for? Because everybody who participated in Carnival made money. Everybody who put stalls outside their house made money. The committee didn't, the council didn't, the government didn't. But it's still, every year, still as we sit here today, comes under pressure not to exist. But actually it's financed by the population largely. People make money out of doing business on the streets and doing Carnival and so on. And I would contentiously argue Things like Tabernacle, which is now a high-class restaurant and a public space, the electric cinema, all of those wouldn't have been preserved without the carnival. So I think one of the things about when we're talking about involving people, it's not just about the whole inclusion argument, it's that's the way to make it last. Carnival still survives because people make money out of it. And ordinary people, not the people you would expect to be making money. That's why it often comes under criticism. I'm not saying it hasn't had challenges of leadership or anything like that. So that thing about involving the community is really critical for making sure that they want it to be there. In this case, it was because they do very well out of it, thank you very much. And I think we've got to think that way as well. So I think it's not just a political thing about class. I think we've got to in practically walk it through to make sure people, ordinary people, the people in these estates around here, value it and want to keep it. Then it's much harder for it to fail. 
Great. Uh, Stephen, I'm kind of taken a, a bit by the, what Bob just said. I mean, but part of the way you work with innovators, social entrepreneurs, part of the characteristic entrepreneurs is they often start out with one idea and end up with something very, very different as they kind of go along. I mean, it, and that seems to be a kind of recurrent theme. You've got to be open to allow your business model, to allow your intervention, to develop in the way which, which, which captures the most kind of public attention or commercial possibility. That's, that's absolutely it. You know, so I think you know, a, lot, a lot of the questions are around this piece of, you know, is heritage a, a middle class uh, uh, you know, kind of um, um, thing and, and not open to others? And I think what you've got to do is, is open up your business model uh, to, to the community. And I'll come back to the definition of community, but open up your business model to your local community and test things and see what works and see what doesn't work. And then usually, you know, you, you'll end up running with the stuff that works. And so I think it's really important that you think about, you know, how do you plan that? How do you go about doing that? You know, how do you create a shared language? And how do you really create a, a bottom-up revolution that's going to lead to, 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 to your heritage service offering something um, that people are bought into, have an emotional attachment to, and, and gives you a level of, of, of credibility? And, and when I say credibility, I mean it gives you a level of credibility with the community. Now, in terms of the question of, you know, what does this term mean? I mean, in, in my line of work, uh, you know, there's kind of two ways of, of understanding it. You know, one can be looking at community-based entrepreneurs, so people who've, you know, emerged from the bottom up. You know, they've been in prison, and then they've started a charity to help people who've also been in prison. Uh, I think another way to look at it is to say, well, you know, what makes up the community you're serving? So you can have the business community, the public sector community, and actually, in the heritage space, uh, your community is the public. You know, it's, it's everyone. It stretches from, you know, the young kid living on, on an estate around the corner right to, you know, a very wealthy person who likes to invest in, in all sorts of things. So that makes it a little bit more difficult, but it means that you've got to try and find, uh, you know, a shared way of, of meeting all those, all those needs. Can I just ask it? You ask the heritage sector to take risks. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, 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 <laughs> the room went quiet there. Yeah. I mean, but it's the it's the only way it's the only way you're going to going to adapt and, and survive, you know. And, and you can take measured risks, right? You know, you can you can test things. So if you have a core business model which has worked for you for years and years and years, it's about saying, well, actually, you know, can I identify a small proportion of budget or space or time or find some you know additional local human capital who can come in and help me test. Some, some different models and, and see if they work and see if I can secure, secure funding. So I think, you know, risk, risk is, is critical. A friend of mine wrote a book called How to Fail as an Entrepreneur, because he did. And uh, one of his, his number one lesson is, is, is fall, fall too madly in love with your first idea, uh, because it'll nearly always be wrong. Um, it's your second, third, fourth or fifth idea that's the one that's going to work. Okay, a couple of points from you. Oh, well, you've left all the difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I just talk, first of all, briefly, this question about heritage, the heritage of the everyday. Um, and it, it ties in with the, the question from the gentleman from Cardiff, I think, about the language that we use. I mean, I think we can easily get hooked on the monumental in, uh, in, in, in heritage. I think what we are talking about, and one of the shifts that we have to make mentally, is that the, um, the Victorian terraces of uh, South, South Wales Valleys are as important in terms of the character of the community as anything else. And somehow, trying to put a language and value around those things is not that difficult because people will respond to that. Once you start opening up the conversations, they see exactly what you're talking about. Wales lost a huge amount of magnificent um, in industrial uh, housing uh, from the middle of the 19th century around Merthyr and Dallas, the great iron centres. And there are just fragments of it left, and it, it still is beautiful. So that, I th I'm, think, I'm absolutely sure that what we try to do in English heritage and it's continuing is to actually identify the value of the everyday and, and, and in, the, in the small conservation areas, for example. Um, so that's one point. Uh, it links, I think, with the other question, which is really difficult. What should we be doing now that in 20 years' time we could look back and say, well, thank God we did it? Well, I've got two things. One is positive and one is a bit more sort of problematic and negative. The positive thing is, I think, around industrial archaeology, because there is masses of it, and it is just hanging on by a thread. But it is capable, whether we're talking about the great colliery sites, when I was talking about this one, the copper, um, where we can actually build beautiful housing, beautiful communities, grounded in a very deep memory of what it has made those communities special and distinct. There is an ambivalence here. A lot of people don't want to be remembered, reminded of the places they worked, 
they didn't enjoy it very much. They didn't want their children to work there. So it, it's, it's complicated. But these are you know, very dramatic and interesting sites, I think, that we should look very um, creatively at. The second thing is, if we want to actually have a heritage, um, which is actually even up to scratch, we have to stop the planning system being undermined and dismantled. We've had the past four years a series of, um, I wouldn't say they're attacks, they're more subtle than that, ways in which the planning system has become compromised in different ways. And it's still going on. There are three bills in Parliament at the moment, actually, which could theoretically undermine historic protections. We have to be on the kiviv the whole time for what's happening to the planning. And that is a grit. You know, we, we won't be able to do anything if at the end of the day we've actually handed the developers even bigger um, incentives to actually not take account of the local environment if we run down our local planning authorities as we are doing so that you don't have experienced specialists who can actually make the case for conservation and know what it takes to actually go and fight for it and fight the developers for it. But it's kind of uh, very quickly because we're running out of time. Yeah. Uh, we work with, there are, say, with some developers, kind of high-end developers. It seems to me some of them have an appreciation of the importance of community and culture and place which is rather Absolutely. admirable, actually, not what you'd associate with a kind of knock it down, build it quick, bugger off mentality. No, and, and, and there, there certainly are those examples, and I could name you half a dozen people who are doing extremely good work, actually in restoring, uh, I mean, and, and making a profit mm. out of it because they recognise that when they build character and they transform old buildings into desirable residences, people will actually come and pay for them, and the whole sort of you know, mm. the housing value goes up. But I'm talking about volume builders, I'm talking about people who are trying to make in, uh, do something with small sites in market towns. They are not actually as conscientious very often, but they, they have to be properly managed. But the, the real problem is we don't have enough decent uh, planners anymore in our local authorities. Okay. Well, that's a whole new topic on its own. No, there's a <laughs> spontaneous applause for that point. Now, we're going to break for tea, but you, uh, you'd be disappointed if you weren't able to vote on the, the greatest vandals to our natural and built uh, heritage. Uh, here it is. So, let's get voting. Oh, no, the Victorians came up earlier. Okay, you weren't paying attention. Um, here we go. And we're going to get to 150. Ooh, just about. Some people are boycotting it. It's too flippant. Um, here we go. Wow. <laughs> There we go. Are there any 60s town planners in the room? <laughs> yes, there we are. That's the, that, you're the one to blame. Okay. So it's a bit of a bundle over tea, I think. Um, uh, uh, before I ask you to thank the panel, uh, can I just say to you, we've got uh, 20 minutes until uh, our, our, our final session at 3.45. You a cup of tea, a piece of fruit, and a biscuit, and a chat. Please, please don't go before our final session. I know that it's uh, tempting if you've got to get home or whatever, but we've got a fantastic final panel. We've got Lloyd Grossman, we've got Laurie Magnus, we've got Peter Bazalgette, we've got Sir John Lawton, we've got Deborah Mattins, we've got Carol Souter from, from the HLF. So that's going to be a brilliant panel session. I promise to get you away at 5 o'clock on time, so do stay for that. But can I ask you first to thank our panel, uh, Bob, uh, Albert, Stephen and Kate. Thank you. <laughs>